and it's told me that recording has started. So, how about we get right into it? So, okay, chapter 24, which is the final chapter of the two semester sequence of organic chemistry, is about proteins. So, uh, you know, the last chapter was about sugars, and now this one's about proteins. So this is really like getting into biological chemistry and like the applications of the organic chemistry that you've been learning. Uh, these two chapters aren't really biological chemistry still because like they're still about how you can work with these molecules in the lab, like, you know, in a organic chemistry lab less so than like a you know biology or biochemistry lab but you know we're, we're still going to talk about the structure of proteins a little bit and like what these uh what amino acids look like and how they like you know assemble together all right so uh it hopefully isn't too surprising that the focus of this section on proteins is all about amino acids which are the building blocks of proteins. I, I will skip writing that one down because, you know, uh, I'm sure that most of you have seen amino acids in some context or another, right? But now you need to worry about the structure of them and how they actually come together. So in general, the structure of an amino acid is like this. So it's got an amine here, and then it's got an acid, and then there's a carbon in between with some group that we always call the R group. It's coming off. And all of the amino acids that are naturally occurring well, I, maybe I should say almost all there's a few rare examples of, uh, well, so, okay, all, pretty much every amino acid is S stereochemistry, which is what I drew up here. Uh, maybe just to, to verify and make sure I'm not telling the wrong thing. Hydrogen is the lightest, nitrogen is the heaviest. Uh, this group here will, I think, generally be second, and this one up here will be third. So we are going in this direction, and some of you might remember the trick that I, uh, that I used last semester, which is uh, if we turn the wheel right, then it's R, and if we turn the wheel left, then it's S. So this is S. Okay. Uh, which is good. That's just a good confirmation. Okay, so pretty much every amino acid that you can find in nature is S stereochemistry, um, which is important. There are like a few different techniques that actually use uh, R amino acids, especially for making drugs, because like uh, all of the enzymes in the body are made to digest or produce S amino acids. So if, let's say you made drugs out of R amino acids, they would last longer in the body. So that's just like a fun fact about amino acid stereochemistry um, that, you know, perhaps you'll see somewhere down the line. So, all right, we have these S amino acids and there are 20 natural oops, one L, amino acids. Okay, there's, I guess, really there's like 22, but uh, for the most part, there's 20 that occur in like pretty much every organism that there is. Okay, for this class, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I know last year we had to memorize the three letter codes of the amino acids. Uh, did he say anything about this in lecture? Is that accurate? A 
Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what he's doing this year exactly, but um, I know that last year we had to, like, one of the things that we had to do was remember the three-letter codes for the amino acids. So we'll run through those quickly. Uh, for the most part, they're all what you'd expect them to be. There are only a few that are, like, slightly different. So, all right, let's run through them. So there's alanine, which is ALA. Ah, uh, okay, actually, how about, instead of going through all of these, because, I mean, you could look them up and, like, find a table. They're not that hard to find. Uh, maybe I'll just say that the three-letter codes are all, they're all just the first three letters of the, the amino acid name, with the exception of four of them. So, an angle, okay. Three letter codes are all the first three letters of the amino acid name, with the exception of four of them. So one is isoleucine, which is I L E. Then there is uh, tryptophan, which is TRP, uh, and then aspartic and glutamic acid. Oh, no, sorry, asparagine and glutamine. So asparagine and glutamine, which are ASN and GLN, which you can compare to like aspartic acid, which is ASP, and glutamic acid, which is GLU. Okay, so you just take the last letter here and replace it with N whenever you have the amine form. So that's just like helpful. I'm not sure if he's going to have you remember all of these codes uh, for this year again. But if he does, then, you know, this is really it. And otherwise, all of the other amino acids have the same like code. Yeah, I'm not sure if he has you remember the structures either. Um, that's a little bit more work. So. You know, if he does, uh, it's usually good to, like, lump them up into groups. So you can lump them by, like, what's nonpolar, what is polar, what is uh, negatively charged, and, like, what's positively charged. And that usually helps to, to get through them. Okay? So, uh, there, yeah. So here are, the like, these codes and things. So this is just, like, a helpful way to remember what these three-letter codes are, because everything else is just the same, okay? And one a discussion in the, sec in the book, and, like, I think he talked about it, um, and this is something that you'll see in any biochemistry class that you wind up taking. Um, amino acids are, like, let's say you take this structure and you just put it into water, well, this NH2 is pretty basic, and this OH is pretty acidic. So they're not going to stay in this form like this. And what will actually happen is you will get what's called a Zwitter ion, which has two different locations of charge. So the nitrogen will get protonated, and then this acid will be deprotonated, and what we, we have whatever else, right? That R group doesn't usually affect the chemistry of these other two groups, okay? And then if we go to something like pH 9, which is basic, then we will deprotonate that amine or 
if we go to like pH, it's usually like two, they say, then which is really acidic, then you will get that acid to be protonated. Oops. So this has a net charge of plus one, this has a net charge of zero, and this has a net charge of minus one. And this R group up at the top can, although it doesn't change the uh, these charges very much, like the amine and the acid that are always there in any amino acid, the R group can also have uh, its own charge, which changes what's called the iso isoelectric point. So this R group can have a charge, so it'll change the isoelectric point. And this isoelectric point is just the pH where the average charge is zero. Okay. And this whole isoelectric point thing is useful um, mainly because you can use it to separate amino acids out in a fairly easy way, right? You just put them in an electric field and then they'll spread apart based on what charge they have. So uh, this is like a useful common thing. Again, if you take some any sort of biochemistry class, this is the sort of thing that they'll talk about. Um, maybe not that much because like in practice, this whole thing is not that useful, but like, you know, People love to talk about it anyway. All right. Yeah, so that pretty much covers the like structural aspects of amino acids. And then there's a section about synthesis. Okay. And you already know, let's see, two out of these three methods. So one, you could do reductive amination. And specifically, you want there to be uh, a carboxylic acid on the end. So you need a ketone next to it, or to put that in words, so of an alpha keto acid. Okay. Meaning that you can have something that looks like this. And then you can aminate onto that ketone. So you aminate and then reduce. And then you'll get an NH2 up there instead. So you've made an amino acid. Okay. No, this is an amino acid because we have an acid here, an amine, and then one carbon in, in the middle. So this is an amino acid, okay? So that's one way. Uh, the second way is if we take an acid and we could do the hell volhard zelinsky uh, bromination on it. So that way we get, so if we start with this, then we can brominate the alpha position of the uh, amino acid, or sorry, of the carboxylic acid, not an amino acid yet. Okay, and now this bromine is a good leaving group, right? We can kick that off pretty easily. So just throw it in a whole bunch of ammonia and There we go, it'll replace that bromine just with standard uh, SN2. So there we go, we have an amino acid again. There's an acid part, there's an amine, there's a carbon in the middle, and it's got something hanging off. So once again, we've made another amino acid. And then there's also the Strecker synthesis. So what this reaction does is, just to be short, it takes an aldehyde 
and it converts it to an amino acid. So here we can start with an aldehyde, which gives us a little bit more potential. And if I'm not mistaken, this uses NH3 and HCN. And I think there's a reduction step in there too. Um, but the idea being is that we can turn this aldehyde uh, into an amino acid at the end. Okay. And right. So that's three ways of synthesizing amino acids, really the three major ones. Uh, biologically, the process is like totally different and it doesn't look like this at all. But in the lab, this is like the, the main way that you would be doing this. Yeah. Okay. So from there, there are some reactions that you've learned. Uh, you haven't learned all of them yet because I think his next lecture includes some more of them because he didn't finish the whole chapter, I think. But you learn some of them and you only need a few to do the problems that we're going to talk about today. So we'll just run through some of the bigger ones. Uh, so a new, one new reaction that you've seen is to take an amino acid. Let's say we have something like that. And then there's this chemical called ninhydrin, which looks like this. Hopefully I got that right. Okay, so this is ninhydrin, um, and the, the like cool or interesting or useful part of this is that if you react these two together, then you get what is pretty much two ninhydrins stuck together. Oops, yeah. Something like this. Okay, and another phenyl ring there. Yeah, so you got something like this, which is called like Ruman's purple. Uh, it's a dye. The, the point is, like, the interesting part is that it's a dye. So you can actually see this. Um, and I think this was discovered by like Madeleine Julier, one of the professors in the chem department. And that was like a, a long time ago. But this is like a, you know, an interesting test for amino acids because, you know, this reaction will happen whenever there are amino acids. So, like, it's particularly useful. Like, the biggest use of it was, uh, I think, in like crime scenes or something, where uh, if you think that like there's someone was there, then you can put ninhydrin on it, you can like spray it on, and, uh, if there are proteins, like if somebody was there and like touched something, then you'll get this purple dye coming out. So that's, uh, I mean, useful, like a, a practical and useful example. You could also, if you uh, don't care so much about crime scenes or whatever, uh, you could use it to get an aldehyde back out. So that's kind of interesting, right? You can isolate the side, the side chain of this amino acid and put it instead into the form of an aldehyde. That's kind of useful. And the one other, well, one of the other uh, useful reactions that you saw was the Edmund degradation. And uh, what this does is it takes the amino acid off of the end terminus of the, the chain that you have. So just for like uh, reference, whenever you have this long chain of amino acids, this is the N terminus, and this is the C terminus. Okay, uh, the N terminus is like you can think of it as like the start of the protein, and the C terminus you can kind of think about it as like the end of the protein. Uh, because whenever you make a protein, you start from N terminus and you go to C terminus. 
that's I guess that's a little bit of biological knowledge. I don't think that's super useful here, but uh, it's kind of relevant for like the solid state proteins or solid and liquid state protein syntheses that uh, you wind up learning about. So uh, kind of useful, but this is more of a biological context. Anyway, what we have is that you have this protein chain and if you take an amino acid that's on the end terminus, Okay, so these amino acids are connected by amide bonds, which in particular are called peptide bonds, just because it's like, you know, this is a feature that's found in every single protein that exists, so, you know, it deserves its own special name. But anyway, if you give it this special reagent, which is usually just written PHNCS, then you will get some reaction that happens like here with this NH2, and then, you know, a bunch of stuff happens. And what winds up happening at the end, the end result is the part that like kind of matters here, is you get this interesting looking structure. So there's your NPH that came from over here. And what happens is you form this interesting ring. So here we go. And I think there's a double bond in there somewhere, maybe. Um, oh, I'm not sure. It's probably over here. I, I'm not going to write it in. There's, There should be a double bond in here somewhere. Um, yeah, I do think it's in here. Actually, I'll write it in because I think this is the only place that I can go into, but I might need to double check on that. And the side chain R comes, over, comes off to here. So that's one of your products. And then the other product is the rest of your protein chain, just with one amino acid removed. So there we go, All right? And maybe just to highlight that with color. So this is, so let me just erase and use it with color. So this red amino acid, this red nitrogen is what stays on the end. Okay. And that means is if we look at the rest of our structure, what we get at the end, what you'll see is that this PHNCS is over here. So we have a PH, we have this N, here's the C, and here's the S. Okay, and let me use one more color. So we also then have this part of our amino acid, which had to go somewhere. And that's what's left. So it comes over here and it forms some of this ring. Okay, so you can see where all the parts went. And uh, well, this is kind of useful, right? This gives us a way to you know, take one piece off of our protein and leave the rest of it intact. We also get this kind of interesting, weird looking thing at the end here. And this is kind of useful because depending on what R is, it has different properties. So we get a different product depending on R. Okay, so this is like one way that you could determine the sequence of a protein, right? You just treat it with this compound one at a time, one, like once at a time. Every time you do it, you can take this compound away 
at the end, analyze it, it'll tell you what amino acid was there, and then repeat it again with this next part of the protein. That's just one amino acid shorter. So this will tell you the sequence of a protein from the N terminus to the C terminus. Okay. So that's one interesting way of like sequencing a protein or determining its structure. Uh, nowadays, there are like way more sophisticated methods and we don't really even have to do this at all. But this was like an early way to do it and this works for short proteins. So uh, this is a fairly important method, but it's also just useful. Um, it's something that like, it's just a reaction that we can actually use. Okay, and so let's see. Last thing I'll talk about before we start actually doing some problems is solid phase peptide synthesis. Okay, so this is like now sort of interesting because we're able to make our own proteins, right? Um, in live organisms and biological things, this is like done by a, using a ribosome, which is like one of the most complicated molecular machines that is known to exist. Like we have no idea how it works. So this is more straightforward. We know the reactions that happen here. Um, there's no absurdly complicated structure involved. It's there are fewer moving parts, okay? So uh, hopefully he mentioned, but maybe he hasn't gotten to it yet, but I just wanted to mention this, just like uh, this one way of doing it so far, because we'll use one of the reactions later. So what you do for solid phase, phase, uh, solid phase peptide synthesis is you use what is called Merrifield resin, which is a polymer, like a, a resin of polymer, which looks something like this. So let's see. Uh, it's a polymer, so you know it extends onward essentially forever. So there's a phenyl and a CH2. And then a phenyl and another CH2, and the chain of CH2s just keeps going, and then, you know, on and off with another phenyl, okay? So you could see that there's this sort of, like, repeating structure like that, except the thing is that some of these phenyls have chlorines on the end, or actually, they have methyl chlorines, or CH2Cl. Okay, on the para end of this phenyl. So that's useful because that chlorine is like a leaving group. And moreover, it's on a benzylic carbon, so you can expect that it'll come off pretty easily. So what happens is that uh, the C terminal terminus or, you know, this carboxylic acid of the protein. Uh, so it displaces the, the chlorine, which anchors the protein onto this resin, okay? So it gives it a solid support for the protein to stay on. And, you know, you stick your first amino acid on, and then you can add a new amino acid and add another one and so on. So you build your protein lengthwise. And then at the end, you just cut it off of the resin. You just like, you know, you take all of the protein off the resin at once, which, you know, from there will, uh, will free up your protein. So you can purify like chemically synthesized 100% pure protein, all right? And the like useful part here is that you use a reaction to do this, which has an amino acid 
So this R is no longer like the R group of the amino acid. It's just whatever else is on the end. So you take this carboxylic acid and this minus charge will attack a compound that's called DCC. Okay. Uh, don't remember what it stands for, but it's used as a coupling agent. So you use it to couple the, like this reaction. So from there you get something that looks like this. And the idea is just that DCC will come off with that oxygen pretty easily. Okay. So you just give it some protein with some, uh, some compound with an amine on it, which will come up here, displace that. And there we go. We've now made an amide. Okay. So this is like the what's at the core of this solid uh, phase peptide synthesis. And this is like a reaction that we'll use in a little bit. Okay, let me save. Uh, what I've written. And I should ask, does anybody have any questions before we start doing some problems? I'll start pulling up one of the problems. Let's see. Oh, this is a very long problem. Or like it's a, it's a large picture so oh my god no okay anybody questions Yeah, there we go. Okay. Let's see. I learned last time how to make it larger. There we go. Okay. So, not an unusual sort of problem. Idea is to fill in all the boxes or give the reagents for these arrows. Okay, so how about we get started? All right, let's go from this first compound on this arrow to make an acid, okay? So we're going from a bromine and we're turning it into an acid instead, okay? And what you'll also notice is that over here, we have one, two carbons, and here we have one, two, three carbons. So we've also added a carbon. Okay. So does anybody have an idea about how to go from this starting compound to the acid? You do an SN2 displacement with um, a nitrile and hydrolysis. Yeah, that's, yeah, so that's one way you could do it. Um, so let's say you put it into, you know, something with a nitrile. You want to displace that bromine with a nitrile. So you can replace it with, you could put it in HCN. And normally when you want to do SN2 with a nitrile, uh, you also put it in sodium cyanide too, just because that way you get a whole bunch of cyanide in there. And from there, let's see, you can use, oh, I don't know, whatever hydrolysis of a nitrile you want. So let's see, if I'm not mistaken, you could just do a really acidic hydrolysis, yeah? All right. Yeah. I think you could just do 
an acidic hydrolysis of a nitrile, which would work, yes. Um, I had a different method in mind. This, this is good. Uh, I didn't even think of this, so this is like good and it actually uses, you know, the things that you've learned more recently. Uh, I had another method in mind. Does anybody... Could you make it a Grignard and then use CO2 and acid? Yeah. So that's what I was thinking at first. Uh, I like this nitrile way, though. That's actually... Uh, that's good. Normally we, like... Normally SN2 to add a nitrile is, like, kind of iffy, but this is, like, a, a primary bromide. It'll, it'll come off perfectly fine. Right, so this this will be effective. This will be work, and and it'll be good. Um, but you could also do you could also turn it into a Grignard, right? So add magnesium, then add CO two, and then aqueous workup. Okay, so either way would work well in this case. Um, I was thinking of the Grignard, but I like the nitrile way too. I guess like. At this point, we've developed enough of a tool set to be able to do reactions in a whole number of different ways. So, uh, I guess at this point, like, whatever one you can think of that'll work, then, you know, that's the one you should use because, well, it'll work. All right, well, how about we look at this other arrow here? So, we want to make this acid and we're doing it using ozonolysis. So this is specifically ozonolysis, and then we put it in water. So this is an oxidative workup. Because we've put it in water at the end. So to do ozonolysis, what do we need in our starting structure? Um, I used an alkyne with an ethyl group coming off on one of the ends. Oh, okay. Let's see. Do we need an alkyne? Yeah. Oh, so I guess if... Uh, yeah, so if we're starting... If we're just using H2O, we're not really doing much of a work up here, right? Um, yeah, because normally if it was like a double bond, then we would use hydrogen peroxide, right? But here we're just using water. So we can use an alkyne, right? And well, there's an H on this end. And if we use that alkyne, then uh, that'll give us an acid right away, right? Because uh, ozonolysis of an alkyne will give you an acid right away. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking that we might start with the double bond, but, uh, no, that's actually way better. Um, on the end of this alkyne, you can have whatever. So if you want to actually be like fancy, you can, uh, stick the same thing on the other end. And I think, I think you might wind up producing two of this compound, but well, I, I, yeah. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, whatever on whatever is on the other end could be could be anything. Okay, and then next we're brominating this uh, this acid that we have. So we're making an alpha bromo acid. So what reaction is that? The HVZ. Um, oh. Yeah. So it's HVZ, which is good, but it happens in two steps. So what's the first step? The PBR3 acts by replacing the OH with the BR. And then, well, I guess it's together. I guess that's part one of step one. And then with BR2. Yeah, and then we have a BR2 also. Yeah. Um, it's good to know the whole mechanism of it. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a mechanism that you that you... Normally should know. I don't know how. I don't know if there's any way for them to test that you know the mechanism of these reactions, but uh, this is a good mechanism to usually know. Okay, so we, you know, brominate this structure. Um, first, we we put a bromine onto the acid, 
So we turn it into a uh, an acyl bromide, then we brominate, and from there, what's the second step? Water. Yeah, it's just water. Uh, it's you know easy to list it as its own step. All right, cool. So now we have this alpha bromo acid, and we add sodium uh, azide. And this azide is really good at something, so what's it going to do? Um, just sure. replace the bromine through, like, SN2. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So azide is just a good nucleophile. Um, yeah, it, you don't... I guess you don't see azide very much at all until like this late in organic chemistry. Um, but yeah, now now we get to start using azide. It's it's a good nucleophile. Um, it's actually like one of the ones that you might have learned earlier is like one of the really strong nucleophiles. So it's very good. So it'll displace that bromide really easily, even though it's like secondary, with no problem. I had a quick question about that. Um, yeah. Is the carboxylic acid also deprotonated because it's like pretty strong? The, the azide nucleophile? Oh, uh, so I think the azide is, it's a good nucleophile, but I don't think it's very basic. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, it's not nucleophilic enough to take off that OH from from the acid. That rarely happens because carboxylic acids are like the most stable of these these things. Um, and I don't think the azide is super like basic, so I don't think it'll deprotonate. It'll more just if anything, it's definitely more nucleophilic than it is basic. So it act, it'll act like a nucleophile first. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, good questions, guys. Yeah, if you have questions. You know, always feel free to ask. Okay, so now we have this azide here, and what we're doing is we're turning this azide into this NH2. So there are, I think, like a good couple of ways to reduce an azide. And does anybody have like a preferred way of reducing this azide? How about I suggest one? Uh, could we use lithium aluminum hydride? Do you guys think that's a good option? No because it would react with the carboxylic acid, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this one, so we can't use this one because it's too strong. Yeah, so this reacts with acid. Okay. So what else can we use instead of lithium aluminum hydride? Um, catalytic hydrogenation. Yeah, that would work perfectly fine. Okay, so you can use hydrogen palladium. Uh, that is strong enough to reduce an azide, no problem. You could also, uh, instead of lithium aluminum hydride, another option is use NADH4. So either one of these two would work uh, to reduce the azide. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there might there might even be like another one or two ways. Uh, whichever way you know to reduce an azide that that you prefer uh, in this case will be totally fine. All right. Well, okay. We're now down at this structure. Okay, and everything comes in and out of this structure. Maybe before going on, just for fun, does anybody know what 
uh, what compound this is. To put it in context, it's an amino acid, right? Because we have an acid, we have an amine, and we have this carbon in, the, in between the two. So, does anybody like know off the top of their head? No, okay. Uh, yeah, so this structure is alanine. This is like, in some sense, this, one of the simplest amino acids, kind of the simplest one, because it's just, uh, it's just a methyl group for a side chain, right? Uh, it's not, not a super complicated one. There's one that's just a hydrogen for a side chain, but as it turns out, that amino acid is actually a lot more complicated because once you don't have a side chain, then the amino acid becomes a lot more flexible. And what that means is you get a whole lot more entropy. So, you know, it gets more messy. But having this methyl there is kind of nice. So the amino acid that we're working with is alanine. So we have a whole bunch of different things we can do with it. All right. And now, from there, let's see. Um, okay. So we've got these, this amino acid, and let's see. Now we're using... Okay, these arrows don't tell us what we're using at all. Well, huh. All right. Okay, well, let's start with this structure at the end that we're going with, up in this upper right corner. All right. Oh, it actually tells us that we're also trying to make it up here. All right. So here we're using ammonia and HCN, hydrogen and cyanide. And we wind up with this NH2 and CN stuck onto it. Okay, so we see that we have two carbons. Okay, so we know we're going to have two carbons because this CH3 and this C here are both there. There's a hydrogen that's stuck to this carbon over here. And what do you think this NH2 and this CN replaced? Is this an aldehyde? This is exactly yeah yeah so it's an aldehyde right we have that hydrogen there which stays on you can't really pull that h off and then yeah uh you have this nh3 which is really good nucleophile and then this cn is also pretty good um at least it'll attack that aldehyde pretty quickly so we started with that this aldehyde uh acetaldehyde if you if you like um and let's see now we have this structure and we want to turn it into alanine so maybe to redraw this we have something that looks like this so i've got that and we've got this and this and this and this right and then there's just the cn hanging off Okay, and we want to turn this CN over here into an acid. And well, we already talked about this, right? You're turning a nitrile into a carboxylic acid. So let's, in our case, let's just use an acidic treatment, acidic hydrolysis of a nitrile. That'll do the job. Okay, and Let's see. So we want to go from alanine up to this structure over here. Meaning that instead of this acid, we want to have a nitrile. Okay. So how might we go about turning an acid into a nitrile? Especially without adding any more carbons, right? Here we have... Uh, one, two, and three carbons, and here we have 
one, two, and three carbons. So how might we go about that? Could we use ammonium to make it the amine? Okay, yeah. So that sounds like a good idea. We need to get a nitrogen on this acid in the first place. So let's put it in ammonia and that OH isn't going to come off very easily, so we're going to have to heat it a whole bunch. All right. Oh, let's see. So your suggestion was to make it an imine, right? Yeah. Ah, OK. I made it an amide instead, because I misheard. Um, but I guess the thing is that this is an acid, and see, it's not going to want to form an imine very easily, right? Because now we've got this sort of structure where there's an NH up here and an OH down here. So this sort of structure will be weird. Um, I don't know too much about making imines on acids. Um, but, well, maybe let's try just turning this into an, uh, an amide instead. So how about we heat it up a whole bunch with ammonia? So now we have something that looks like this. And then are we able to go from this structure down here up to what we want at the end. Can you use the P2O5 to dehydrate it? Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. Um, so you can, yeah, you can use P2O5. I'm bad at drawing with this. Let's see, P2O5. Yeah. Alternatively, uh, POCl3 is another good option that you can use to dehydrate it. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, that's the way that I was thinking. Do this. Um, maybe there are other ways to do it. Uh, this might be the fastest. I feel like any other way to go about it would involve reducing the the acid. And let's see, once you're there, well, that's one step, and then you'll have to use up a couple more to get to a nitrile. So this seems like it might go in the fastest, the, the fewest number of steps. Yeah. So, okay, we have this this whole branch of our reaction map. Okay, looks good. All right. So, how about we work backwards from alanine over here? Okay. So, what are we able to reduce in order to... Uh, turn it into this alanine. We also know that over here we started with this alpha keto acid and we gave it NH3. So what did we form in between? Uh, so this NH3 will, let's see, it'll attack over here onto that ketone. And instead of there being a ketone there anymore, what will be there instead, which we can reduce? Uh, is this imine formation? Yeah. So we make okay. an imine. Double bond NH. Yep. There we go. 
So there's an NH with an imine. Um, and from there, yeah, we could do catalytic hydrogenation. That'll easily take care of that imine. So then we get alanine, right? Uh, you will have noticed that this is the reductive amination pathway. Okay, we've got a ketone, we aminate it, we reduce it. Those are the steps that we've taken, right? Maybe let's come up over this way because I think down here is a bit of the more complicated ways. All right, so how about we go up here to this upper left pathway? So we're just starting with this cyclic amide and we're going down to here. Uh, maybe just to get your memory working. Does anybody remember what cyclic amides are called? Lactams? Yeah, so this is a lactam. Right? Lactones are cyclic esters, lactams are cyclic amides. I hope. <laughs> so, okay, we have this cyclic, cyclic uh, amide and Let's see. What we well we went we go from something that's cyclic to something that's not cyclic. So you can bet that we're gonna break it somewhere, and you know we're gonna break it at this amide bond because that's really the only place that we have something to work with, right? So okay, we'll break it over there, and then if we draw that breaking, then we get an an H two up there. Let's see, an O down here and something. So presumably we'll get an acid out at the end, okay? So what's a nice way to break an amide and get an acid out at the end? An alcohol, ROH. Oh, okay. So let's say we use, if we use ROH, then that will attack where? Oh, wait, this could be wrong. Oh, so, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so if we had this alcohol attack, then, okay, it might come in there and then break that apart. But then we would get this ester at the end. So even simpler than that, if we... Instead of having an R over there, then how about we just have water? Water. Or uh, specifically because we need a little bit of something to get it going, we'll do it in acid. So this will just be an acidic cleavage of an ester. Okay. So in this case, we just want we just want water to break it. which in some sense is an alcohol too, so <laughs> yeah. Um, there we go, yeah. Okay, yeah, so we've got that up there. All we're doing here with this lactam is just throwing it in some acid. Uh, because, like, I mean, look at this thing, it's a three-membered ring. Uh, it's under a whole ton of strain, so it'll come apart really easily. Uh, even more than that, it's this uh, this carbon over here is sp2 hybridized, so those bonds are going to be really wide, right? Because this is like 120 degree bonds, but you know, triangles have 60 degrees for each uh, each corner. So okay, this will, this will be really strained. So this thing will pop right open really easily. So we could probably put it in some fairly mild acid, and it'll They'll come apart without too much difficulty. All right, how about we look over down here at the bottom bottom left. So we're taking this structure here, which is, well, a little complicated. It's got these two esters, right? Maybe this is like one of those uh, those compounds that you learned about in the in what chapter twenty two, right? 
where here we have two carbonyls and there's this thing in between them. There's this carbon in between them, right? So here we've got these two esters. Uh, and we're putting it in some, this is a mild base, this potassium carbonate. Okay, and we're also giving it this stuff here, which is like phthalate, I think. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is this compound going to be acting like? Like a nucleophile? That's right, yeah. Uh, so it's like super weird to think about it, right? Because this is huge. This thing is like really what we would think of as being really bulky. But this nitrogen, I mean, it has those two electrons that are pretty free and they'll react pretty easily, right? Uh, like you learn something along these lines when we saw the Gabriel synthesis like some while back. So anyway, this thing will react as a nucleophile pretty well. Okay, and the only thing to really kick off is that bromine. Well, I guess I can't really say that because you could kick off the uh, methoxides as well. So it could attack those, uh, those esters, but you'd probably wind up with something that looks like Something that looks like this, and a ring, and yeah, we've got, there's three car uh, three carboxyls here all next to each other, and that would be really, well, it would be an interesting setup to say the least. So uh, this probably, something like this probably isn't going to happen. And instead, we've got that bromine, and bromine will come off pretty easily. It's like a good leaving group. So uh, it's more likely that we'll wind up displacing the bromine. Okay. So anyway, just to draw out what that looks like. There we go. And then, yeah, here we go. This whole big structure. Looks like that. Okay. So that's what we've got. Um, well, all right. So from there, let's see. We are putting uh, a methyl onto it. Okay. Kind of interesting. So how are we going to wind up getting a methyl onto this central carbon? Like uh, now what property of this whole setup that we have, these two esters on either side, are we going to use to get that methyl on? I added a hydroxide ion to take off the alpha hydrogen and then okay. added um, methyl iodide. Yeah. There we go. So you could use, I guess, really whatever base uh, you'd like. So like, uh, I guess in this case, uh, well, hydroxide is fine. You could totally use it. Uh, another good choice might be uh, sodium methoxide because you have these uh, methoxides on the ester already. So this would work pretty well. You probably don't need a base that's this strong, but hey, I guess it won't hurt so much, right? So we have this methoxide ion, and from there you can give it methyl iodide, which is good, right? Methyl iodide will attach onto anything really easily. So that would work well. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we need some base. We need, uh, and we need methyl iodide. All right, and now we're up here, and we want to get over to alanine. And this, this really seems weird, right? 
So let's see. Here's our. Let's maybe it'll help to draw out the structure. Right. Uh, how about I move this stuff over to the other side just to get a little bit more room. And iodide. Okay, there we go. So here's what we've got. But I, how about I zoom in a little bit? Okay. All right. So there's what we're working with, and we want to get. Let's see. What do we want to separate out? So we want this N over here, right? We want this carbon between the nitrogen and the, uh, and the acid. We want this CH3, which is our side side chain. And then we want what's over here. Okay. So we have two amides because this N is between those uh, D double bond O's. And we have two esters that we want to sort of get rid of. Okay. So this might be like a, there's a lot going on, and this shows it in just one step. But you know that you want to get rid of these esters, and you want to break up these amides. Oh, I, I pointed at those the wrong way, right? You want to break up these amides, and you want to also break up these esters. So if you were to take a guess, what do you think you would use to uh, to do all that at once? Um, acidic hydrolysis. Yeah, exactly. Yep. You would just use acid. Um, and I guess a whole bunch of it. But acidic hydrolysis will do all of those different reactions for you. Um, yeah. So you could do acidic hydrolysis. And I guess you should also use some heat because you want to take off this you want to take off one of the two carboxylic acids that's there so that'll wind up coming off as co2 so you got to kind of you know you got to give it a little bit of effort but otherwise it'll break up those amides Can you explain how it does all of these steps ah uh, yeah okay so let's see maybe let's put our structure down here. So this is this is some trash from earlier. Uh, okay, so here's what we've got. I'll just leave that as a methyl. Or now how about I put the methyl over there and then Here we go. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe one step at a time. So like we have uh, we have this ester, and so we're just protonating it, and from there we have a water attacking. Oh, uh, you know, that winds up removing this, this O, how about I draw a little bit more. So here's for the ester. We can do that. Uh, here we go. Okay. So, oops, I undid the wrong stuff. Okay. The electrons move up to there. So we have an OH there. There's this O whatever else, uh, and 
and we have an OH2 hanging off. So this O is going to, you know, take off one of these hydrogens, uh, and it's going to get kicked off. So, okay, this is like our usual breaking an ester by putting in an acid. Uh, this is the reverse of the Fischer esterification that I just drew. Because we have an ester, we put it in acid, so the standard reaction to happen is for it to turn back into an acid. Right? So that's for the ester. Uh, for the amide, go over here. All right. Uh, we have this N, there's a double bond O, C double bond O. There's the, all this. Uh, there's a loop. Right, so uh, pretty much the same reaction. I think this is all, this actually happens exactly the same. Right, so H and then OH2. Okay, there we go. So uh, acidic water, right? And then okay, so water goes up here, displaces, right? Uh, technically equilibrium. So anyway, do that a couple of times, same mechanism as for what happened up here, and then uh, from there you wind up getting an H, okay? And you will have something instead that looks like this. Okay. So we've broken one amide, uh, and then you repeat for the second amide. Repeat for amide two. Okay, anyway, you do all that process, and then you just wind up with that NH2 on the end, because we've broken both of those amides. Great. So now what we're left with is this structure. There was a methyl and then there was an NH2. Okay, and we only want to keep what's over here. Right? So we have to get rid of this carboxylic acid. And let's see. I don't know if I've seen the mechanism for this one so much. Uh, but if you have these like two acids next to each other and you put them in this really strong acid, then uh, you'll decarboxylate. And it'll come off as CO2, I believe it should. But Let's see, if I were to try to think of a way for this to happen. Uh, hmm. Let's see, maybe it would look like... Hmm. So we need uh, this bond to become a bond with the hydrogen. So how about what might happen is this OH, the OH on this end at the left might, hmm. okay, the way, that, the way that I think this would happen, like looking at it uh, from a mechanism standpoint, is that this will become sort of like a, like a um, an enol, sort of, except like a double enol, I guess, maybe, uh, because this thing will come off. So what I think that would look like is, okay, this thing will get protonated, and okay, there's this OH plus,
Okay, and this is all happening in acids, so we can only have positive or neutral charges, right? But then this O is going to put electron, like make a bond there, which is then going to kick this bond over to here and then kick that bond up. So that gives us CO2, which I guess has a hydrogen on it, and then that'll come off without a problem. Uh, and in addition to that, we also get this sort of like phenol that's over here, like this. So that's two OHs there. And then from there, I think this would do like keto enol tautomerization. Uh, and that would get you the acid back. Yeah. I think that the mechanism would look something like this. Um, I haven't seen this mechanism done out explicitly before, so I can't like be 100% guaranteed, but I think it would look along these lines. Um, regardless of if it's exactly like this, uh, the main idea is that one of these two will come off as like a CO2, it'll get decarboxylated. Okay. Yeah. So I guess like you're doing acidic hydrolysis of an ester, you're doing acidic hydrolysis of an amide, and then you're doing like an acidic decarboxylation is all of what's happening. Hopefully that sort of gets at your question. These don't necessarily have to happen in this order. Um, yeah, I mean, you could tell there's like sort of three different reactions going on. You probably need to do the ester hydrolysis before you can do this last step uh, with the decarboxylation, probably. Um, yeah, although I haven't, I haven't seen the mechanism for this, so this is what I think it would be, most likely. Um, it's possible that it's more complicated than this because, like, you know, decarboxylation involves breaking a carbon-carbon bond where that can get sort of fuzzy. Um, yeah, this is what I think. So hopefully that's along the lines of what it looks like. All right, how about we now tackle this last uh, pathway? Maybe before moving on, uh, does anybody else have any questions about this like last reaction that I talked about uh, with you know all of these reactions happening at once? Okay, um, so how about we do this last one? So now we're taking this amino acid here, and all right, well, we're turning it into this more complicated thing over here. So we have something that we start with. Okay, and we can see that we have it over here as well, and we actually have two copies of it. So we're sticking two copies of the amino acid together. Um, and I guess particularly, we're making a peptide bond here, right? Because this part here, this carbonyl and this uh, well, this amide over here is a peptide bond. Okay. So if we want to make a peptide bond, uh, what, like, 
reagent should we use? What compound should we use for it? Anybody? This is the one we mentioned earlier that I kind of talked about in the like review sort of part. Um, a pro I guess another protected amino acid with the DCC reagent. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we'll we'll use DCC for this because we're combining two amino acids together. Um, oh well, I closed the review thing. Maybe wait. I like. I bet I can open it. Yeah. Here we go. Right. So I mentioned this all the way at the bottom. But if we go down, all the way down to here. Okay, so if we have this, uh, if we have a carboxyl group, then we can give it DCC. It will couple like that. And then if there's anything else with an NH2 there, then it'll kick the DCC off and make a peptide bond. Okay, so in this case, we have a whole bunch of alanine in solution. And we want to combine two alanines together. So to do that, all we need to do is just add one equivalent DCC. Close this off. There we go. Yeah. So we just need to add one equivalent of DCC. That'll do it. Uh, it'll couple onto that carboxyl group. And then this NH2 will attack and take off the DCC from a different alanine. So that's it. Okay. Then we make this peptide bond. And let's see. Now we're using lithium aluminum hydride with aqueous workup. All right. So how about I redraw the things that won't get touched? All right, so this carboxylic acid, what happens to it? So we so we have this uh we have this carboxylic acid on, uh, on the end, and we're putting it in lithium aluminum hydride. So this is like a, an old reaction that we've worked with a whole bunch, and that will just reduce into an alcohol. Okay, no need to worry about all the other crazy stuff going on. Um, this acid, if we just look at it on its own, it'll reduce into an alcohol. So. That's what will happen. And then what happens over here to this uh, carbonyl group that is part of this amide? Do we still have an alcohol in this final structure? Or I should say, do we have an oxygen left? Okay. Uh, so one of the reactions that you've seen earlier is if you have an amide and you give it lithium aluminum hydride, then what happens is it turns into an amine instead. So this C double bond O just disappears altogether. Okay, It just turns into an amine instead, which means that this is our final structure. This is it. Okay, we've just reduced that alcohol, or sorry, we've reduced that acid, and this amide just turns into an amine, which happens when we use lithium aluminum hydride.
Okay. Any questions remaining? How about I pull up the next problem? There you go. Okay. So problem two is predict the products, which is everybody's favorite. Okay. So here we go. Predict the products. All right. Wait, uh, I want my pen. There we go. Okay. All right. So, well, let's just go through these. There's six of them. Uh, hopefully not so bad. Okay, here we have an acid and there's a ketone. And this is an alpha keto acid. Because the ketone is in the alpha position. Okay. And from there, we're taking NH3. So we put it in ammonia and then we reduce it. Okay. So we're making an amine and we're doing it with reduction. Hopefully that sounds familiar. So this is a reductive amination. Okay. So let's say first step of reductive amination, this NH3 is going to do what? Like, what is it going to make? Um, an imine. Yeah, exactly. So we first get an imine, and then that reduces into what? The alpha amino acid. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and cool, yeah, we've actually just made an amino acid through that process. Uh, any guesses on what this amino acid is? I think yeah. it's alanine. alanine. Yeah, yeah, it's alanine. It's exactly the one we were working with before. Yep. Uh, we probably actually even did this reaction earlier. Let's see. We... Oh, wow. This is kind of messy. Here we go. Yeah. See? We used, uh... We used NH3 over here, and then we used hydrogen on palladium. So, yeah. We've seen this exact one before. It's to make alanine. All right, here we go. Uh, we have this acyl chloride over here, All right? And this is an amino acid. Uh, maybe I won't torture you guys too much with guessing all about this. Uh, this amino acid is called threonine. Okay. How about this? This question I will ask you. Uh, what is the three-letter code of threonine? THR? Yeah, exactly. It's just one of the normal ones, uh, so you just take the first three letters, okay? So, there we go. We have this amino acid, um, Oh, wait. Oh, this might not be threonine. Hold on. I might be totally wrong. Yeah, wait. No, it's not. All right. Just kidding. Okay, well, you got some good practice about naming, but that, that wasn't right. Uh, this is valine, which, okay, you got the last one right, so I won't make you guess again. It's uh, just V-A-L. Okay. Uh, this is valine. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Okay. Well, really got that one wrong. Uh Okay, so here we go. We have uh, a valine here with an amine, and it's got a carboxylic acid, and we put this acid chloride in there. So 
presumably something is going to attack this acid chloride and replace the Cl. So do you think it's going to be the amine or the acid? The amine? Yeah, exactly. So this amine will come around here. There we go. Take that off. And Okay, and then let's redraw everything. So COH over here. Here is an NH. And okay, well, let's say everything stays the same. Okay. Anything else happen? As far as I can tell, this is all that happens in this reaction. Okay, uh, this pyridine is here to act as a base because look, we went from NH2 to an NH. So at some point in that process, we had an NH2 with a plus charge. So we just use that pyr uh, the pyridine to take off that plus charge. So hey, all right, let's. There we go. Sure. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Not a lot more complicated. All right, so here we've got, let's see, two amino acids. Okay, so here is, uh, let me use some colors. So here is the first of them. So this amino acid is glycine. which is GLY, Gly. And then let's look at the next one. So this one over here, which, well, I'm not gonna ask for the like, you know, fifth time. Uh, this is just with a methyl group as a side chain. So this is alanine. Okay. And Okay, cool. Anyway, uh, fun facts aside, so we're putting it with this uh, phenyl NCS, which we saw before. We saw it in the Edmund degradation. Okay, so we're using that, and then we have this uh, this H plus. Okay, so we're just doing an Edmund degradation, which means that we're going to pull off the N-terminal amino acid. So we're pulling off that glycine, okay? And this is one of the situations where you should like remember what the structure looks like that you get at the end of the Edmund, Edmund degradation, okay? So th remember, this is the one where you get that weird ring, okay? So it looks like this, and then there's the side chain which over here is just a hydrogen. So we just get hydrogens there. Okay. So this is the structure that you wind up getting at the end. Okay. You can see, if I use some colors, that we still have that glycine. It's still that, well, it's, you know, we don't have it in the form of glycine anymore. But you can see the remainder of it in that structure at the end, right? And the Edmund degradation, the other thing it leaves you behind with is the rest of your peptide, okay? So from there, we just get the rest of our peptide. Okay, that's it. So we've gone back and we've synthesized alanine alone from this dipeptide, this thing with two amino acids. Okay. All right, let's Why see what's next. the product with the C double bond S at the top? Is this like the final product or should you go the one step further? 
Oh, is it C double bond S at the end? Whoops. I uh Oh yeah, you're right. Did I uh maybe earlier I didn't draw the full complete structure. Yeah. So this thing actually goes one step further and in acid it reacts to form something like this. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Whoa. Oh my god. Okay. I made a I made a large mistake. Uh Sorry. This uh Edmund degradation pulls off the C terminus amino acid. I'll I'll have to rewrite that. Whoops. I was uh Yeah, I was totally No, wait, wait, wait. No. It takes off the yeah, it takes off the one on the N terminus, right? Let's see. Yeah, sorry, I was looking at the wrong thing. Okay. No, it should take off the thing at the, on the end terminus, shouldn't it? I, uh... Am I missing something? Yeah, so I think it, it yeah, it should be pulling off the end terminus. Um, so what you wind up with should be that alanine. Still, that, that one doesn't change. And then... The other structure that you get, uh, let's see, maybe, yeah, uh, the thing I drew earlier was like the intermediate, which I messed up, yeah, and then, uh, there's that side chain that you get at the end, so it looks like that, okay, yeah, sorry about that, wait, I, yeah, I got confused, because, uh, so I looked over at the answer key and it had the alanine uh, over here, and then it had that glycine was the free amino acid at the end. Although, yeah, I'm pretty sure you pull off the one on the N terminus, unless anybody uh, disagrees with me, which is totally okay. I might have uh, might have mixed this one up a little bit. Like earlier with like this valine or whatever, but I think this is I think uh, it should be like this because the Edmund degradation usually pulls off the N-terminal amino acid, right? Okay. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. So I don't know. This answer key is just uh. Weird, I guess. Um, yep, yeah, okay. All right, well, this is it. Sorry, I was just checking up. I was, like, just referring back to the textbook because, uh, having a, you know, minor crisis there. But, okay, all right, whatever. Here we go. We have this aldehyde, and we're giving it an amine and a nitrile. So... This might seem familiar because we did a reaction like this earlier. Okay, so let's see. We had, oh, where was it? Okay, so we had this aldehyde and we're giving it an amine and a nitrile. Okay, so what we saw is that that aldehyde got replaced with, well, the amine and the nitrile, right? So same reaction as before. Okay, we have this, here's our hydrogen, and one of these turns into a CN, and then the other one turns into our amine. Okay, and well, that's it. We, yeah, we've done it. Uh, this aldehyde just gets removed. Uh, the NH2 will attack it. Um, yeah, let's see. This, yeah, so I think this NH2 will attack it first, and then the CN will attack after. Um, I might have the order mixed up on that, though. But, yeah, here's our, this is the final product that we wind up with, which, hey, we saw earlier. Kind of convenient.
Okay. All right, next up. So we have this compound, which again, this one is ninhydrin. Just uh, one compound that, like a really large one, but you'll see it often uh, in this section and chapter. So we have ninhydrin and, all right, we have an amino acid. So uh, from what we remember about this reaction, we get, we get the dye, we get RCHO, where R is the, R is this thing, and then we get CO2 gas. Okay, and well, just for fun, this amino acid over here is phenylalanine. Okay, uh, you might have, you, or you might notice that this is just an alanine, except over here we have this phenyl group that's on it. So, you know, the naming for this one actually kind of makes sense, as opposed to pretty much all of the rest of them. All right, well, so this one's kind of straightforward. It's formulaic, right? We know what the product is going to be. We just, it's just a matter of drawing it. So knowing the structure of this dye is a good idea because it's likely that you will have to, well, I guess you can't draw it uh, with, you know, given how this class is run, but you should know that this will be, this is the structure that you get at the end. And then, okay, we take our side chain, which is pH and then this, uh, this carbon, and then that becomes an aldehyde. And then plus CO2 gas goes up. So that's it. This reaction is really just like a, you know, uh, this is the most equivalent of maths plug and chug as it gets, right? Uh, you, you just have to replace this R, and otherwise the answer is exactly the same every time. All right, here we go. Um, so next up, we have acetic anhydride and pyridine. So the pyridine suggests it's acting, well, the pyridine will probably be acting as a base. So that means we'll be deprotonating something somewhere. Okay, which probably means that we're just going to attack this acetic anhydride with something over here. Right. And this looks really similar to what we did up in part B, where we had this acid chloride and we just reacted with the amine. So what I suggest is that this is the exact same problem, essentially. Just, you know, it's packaged a little bit different, but otherwise it's, it's pretty much the same. So this thing will attack over here and kick off one of those uh, acetyl groups. But... The relevant part is that we get that acid stays the same and it doesn't react. And then this NH gets acetylated like that. Okay. And okay, there we go. That's, that's our answer. That is it. Um, not too complicated of a reaction. You this is using like old stuff. It's just packaged in the form of like amino acids, but otherwise you've done reaction like this countlessly many times. So yeah, there we go. All right, how about I pull up, how much space do I have on this? Oh, here we go. Yeah, why don't I just paste it on the same thing? Um, while I do, are there questions? If there are. As always, um, yeah. So for 2D, like, do you form the amine and then you get attacked with the, you attack with the nitrile? Is that what it is? Because I thought that my product was just an amine with the 
instead of the double bond O, you have the double bond N with the pH, but I guess it's because I didn't react it with the nitrile, is that right? Oh, uh, oh, let's see, yeah, um, yeah, I haven't thought much about the mechanism here. I think that this mechanism is like this reaction, like reacting with a uh, an amine and HCN, is like that's pretty much the Strecker synthesis. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and so let's see. Don't remember exactly this uh, mechanism. Okay, okay, so textbook. I would just make it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Yeah. I think. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm almost certain you, you form the amine first. Yeah, so you form the amine first, and then once you have an amine, that nitrile is able to just attack up into the amine. Gotcha. Which, yeah, which then makes it an amine instead. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, actually, that it, yeah, that is, like, the Strecker synthesis. I guess Strecker synthesis is normally, like, using just ammonia instead of an NH2 something, but... Yeah, uh, that's where I got thrown off. Yeah. Uh, but I think that pH doesn't... This, uh, this phenyl group doesn't, doesn't change it much. Okay. All right. Last couple. Let's run through these. Here we go. Um, oops. Okay, so how about I zoom in so that we can actually see what's going on? All right, we want to get from, okay, actually, how about I, even better, maybe, uh, okay, let me copy these over one at a time because uh, these are a little bit more. A little bit more involved in these predictive product ones. So here we go. Copying. All right. That's it. So we want to go. My pen. Nice. All right. So we want to go from this ketone over here to having an azide. All right, and while we're not experts of azide chemistry, but we know one good thing about azides, which is that they act as very good what? Nucleophiles? Yeah, right? So what we know is gonna happen, because the only it's the only reaction we know how to do with azides, is that we're gonna do SN2. So we're gonna use sodium azide and we're gonna do SN2 on some leaving group. All right. And cool. Uh the the issue is that sodium azide will attack it'll sodium azide could attack a carbonyl pretty well. Uh, I don't know if that's that'll happen too much. Uh, yeah, I guess sodium azide would likely attack at the carbonyl. I think we did a reaction earlier where like, let's see. I think we did it, we did like it this earlier when it was brominated first. Huh? We did it earlier when it was brominated first. Yeah, uh, it was, oh man, this is truly messy. Yeah, here we go. It was over here, right? So we had this acid and it's brominated, so it'll SN2 that, uh, that bromine off. It didn't, so in this earlier one, it didn't attack the, uh, the carbonyl, but that's because it's tied up in an acid. I guess, 
in other cases, Azides would attack this Carbonyl. Uh, I I guess I probably wouldn't worry about it too much. The reason I say is because uh, this like the the solution that I have says like to uh, to use a uh, an acetal to protect the ketone. So all right, well let's let's say that we do. Um, because this azide might be reactive enough to attack that ketone. So maybe just to be sure, we'll want to do the uh, the SN2 on the acetal. Okay, so all right. So if we have an acetal, usually we'll just use ethylene glycol. That's kind of the uh, oh uh, yeah okay. So he go back, we could just use acid. Uh, to do the SN2, well, all right, we have some leaving group, right? We can go back from there because, all right, well, we just made that acetal, so uh, okay, so all right, well, let's say, you know, we went through this trouble of making the acetal uh, just to make sure that the, az the azide doesn't attack the carbonyl. Okay, we could be extra very sure. Anyway, the important point here is that uh, arrows in the wrong direction. The important point is that we want to go from this ketone to having a leaving group on it. Okay. So what's a good reaction that we might be able to do that with? Um, I, oh, the Br2 with acid, so it only brominates once. There we go. Yep. That works perfectly fine. So brominate it with acid. And then, well, we don't need leaving group anymore because we know what a good one could be. So we could use bromine. All right. From there, you can add this ethylene glycol and some acid to catalyze. Okay. Sodium acid, azide. To, uh, to do the SN2, and from there, all right, get rid of that acetal. Okay, so this would work. Yeah. Um, are there any other syntheses? I, I don't think I, I was able to think of one earlier. All right, here, let me grab. Grab the next problem. So here we go. Paste. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Same strategy. We're going to do retrosynthetic analysis here. That's kind of how we started with earlier. Uh, and then we just kind of met our way in the middle. So here we have an alpha bromo acid. And there is one really good way of making alpha bromo acids. And what would that be? HBZ reaction? Yep. Exactly. So do HVZ. Okay. One, give it PBR3 and bromine. Two, put it in water. All right. And so let's say then that we, whoops, not aromatic. Let's say that we started with this over here. Okay. So what we want to do is turn this chlorine 
into an acid, into a carboxylic acid. So, all right, how can we do that? Could you do um, make it a Grignard and then react it with carbon dioxide? Exactly. Yeah, that is, I think, pretty uncontested best way of doing that. Yeah. So make it into a Grignard and then just carboxylate it from there. All right. And then you have the acid and there you go. HVZ is going to make you an alpha bromo acid really quickly so that seems like a fast way of doing it um yeah i think other ways would wind up getting more complicated somehow okay all right where did this problem go Okay. And, okay, cool. All right, here we go. So we start with this uh, cyclohexanol, and then we want to go to this final compound at the end. So you can see that we're adding this long carbon carbon chain. All right, uh, okay, so how might we go about making this carbon-carbon bond, especially while we have an alcohol here? Well, okay, we know that we can't use Grignard's or organolithic, any organometallics, right? because this OH will just cancel those. But, well, let's say, let's say that we had a ketone. Oh no, I keep doing that. <laughs> All right, let's say that we had a ketone. Uh, what can we do with this ketone now to make it nice and reactive? Could you use LDA? All right, so let's use LDA. Oh my god. All right, so we have a minus charge there now. And Okay, well, this problem doesn't have any restrictions on what we can do, so maybe this is a little bit silly, but why don't we just give this long carbon chain as the thing that we're attacking onto, right? Why don't we just say, all right, let's just take that Let's see, we want one, two, three carbons. So I have one, two, and three. And then why don't we just give it some leaving group? Uh, bromine is fine. Everybody likes bromine. Okay. So there we go. That will do SN2 pretty much like anything else usually would. And then... All right, so we got that structure. And then now going from this alcohol to the ketone is easy, all right? You can use really whatever your favorite thing is. So how about we do Swern? And over here, we're going from a ketone to an OH. So we can use some fairly mild conditions. We can use sodium borohydride. Okay. So that's not such a bad synthesis, right? That's one, two, three, four steps. Which is, you know, hey, that's that's totally reasonable. Okay. Um, there's one more problem in the worksheet, but I realized, I found earlier that it actually has like a typo or like it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, I think it winds up being like, a lot more complicated. We could talk about it uh, next week, I think. So, 
uh, we won't we won't go over it today.